<laughs> All right, Jordan. You can oh, you want to do this one? You could be huge. I'll change it the way through. I think it's hilarious. Makes the podcast okay. more fun. Okay. Listen, not everything on the Agard podcast has to be deathly serious. Okay. I'm down with that. I think that it's probably healthier if we had, if we approach this conversation from an open hearted or an openly open to fun perspective. It'll probably go better that way if we do. Well, look, everything going on lately is so uh, we're now in front of a fireplace. Everything going on lately is so uh, I would say extreme that it's nice to bring a little humor to it. Humor crumbles, calcification, tyranny. Let's yeah, let's not take any of it too seriously. I'm trying really hard in my life to let go of some of that because as dire and as serious and as foreboding a lot of things seem that are going on, I do find that laughter is is very much medicine in the face of it all. And it and it it it, it might accomplish more to change things than than serious debate in in a lot of in a lot of ways. You know, comedy is is so effective against um against totalitarianism against Mm -hmm. tyranny you know against control all of it yeah um for those of you don't know jordan fultz is a good friend of mine and he's a brilliant individual and uh one of the main focuses that jordan and i talk about is about men's issues and also about the perception of masculinity in society not just our own but throughout history and so jordan's been a, a great uh kind of leader in that space and uh has done a lot of great work so i like to bring jordan on hopefully we're going to start doing this every week not in front of a fireplace in front of a fake fireplace i don't know why the fireplace isn't moving but i figure we start making these a little bit more fun and uh yeah these are just going to be changing the whole time i'll stop changing these once we get serious i'll go to like a normal a normal view but for now i kind of like it because these are the new features available on this and so That's what it is. Oh, uh, this is weird. This is so Why do you get to be the lecturer? Come on, man. Am I the lecturer? I'd be facing yeah, the other way. I guess it's because you're you're running the you're the you're the whatever the host. <laughs> yes, teacher. What? Um, all right. Well, okay, so let's just jump right in. So you had you had raised, you sent me that article that uh China is no longer allowing effeminate or what did they write sissy did they write sissy they wrote, they wrote lots of things i think we should read an article about it but i think what i sent you as a michael knowles was a was a segment from michael knowles's show and he was reading i don't know what 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 he was reading whether he was reading the press release from the chinese communist party or whether he was reading uh an article or something like that but i find this i find this fascinating and there's so many different ways to approach talking about it but yeah let's first let's first explain what it is so people know hold on let me go back to the fireplace we'll leave that for a bit and then i'll jump to regular okay so what it is is that essentially michael knowles framed it in 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 this way that it was a response to disney's or amazon's new cinderella trailer that the ccp was actually responding to this because there's kind of a flamboyantly gay fairy godmother in it who's very diva out and very effeminate in his uh in his garb and uh it sounds like maybe the ccp came out in response to that i haven't read that specifically in another article but bottom line is the ccp has come out with new media and personal like uh celebrity presentation standards wherein yeah there's it's no longer allowed to be an effeminate male in their in their media entertainment um including music i believe in boy bands and 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 that that type performance entertainment um as well no more uh effeminate uh sissy boys let me read let's start with just a little article on it so we can get that out of the way i'm you know i really am not a huge fan of npr um i find they write a lot of positive articles on xi jinping in china and are not nearly critical enough and they're just propagandistic in general but um, let's just read what they wrote on this because I think it's funny to to kind of um, hear them try very hard to be objective about this. So uh, Beijing, uh, September 2nd, 2021, China's government banned effeminate men on TV and told broadcasters Thursday, okay, so last thir- Thursday, so a week ago, to promote revolutionary culture, broadening a campaign to tighten control over business and society and enforce official morality 
Xi Jinping has called for a national rejuvenation with a tighter Communist Party control of business, education, culture, and religion. Companies and the public are under increasing pressure to align with its vision for a more powerful China and a healthier society. It's funny how NPR chooses this one issue to, to call, call some criticism to Xi Jinping's and China's authoritarianism when they let so much pass uncommented on. Um, but this goes against NPR's uh, aesthetics, obviously. Um, the party has also reduced children's access to online games, which I think is something like three hours a week now. Um, this is what this is what they have in quotations. Broadcasters must resolutely put an end to sissy men and other abnormal aesthetics. The word they use for that is niang pao, which literally means girly guns. Um, so, you know, um, that I, I won't go on about it, but that's, um, that's what's going on. And so, yeah, I can hand it to you to kind of speak about it from your perspective, what you want, but it's interesting to see people's reactions to this because on the right, let's say on, on the right, using right and left is obviously never a perfect fit. But what I see on this, on the right in response to this is this sort of gleefulness, like, like, oh, this authoritarian far left uh, regime is, is appealing to traditional standards of presentation um, and, uh, and gender um, as a moral framework, mm -hmm. as something that, that, that is going to enhance and build and, uh, and benefit their society. And I've even seen some on the right uh, I don't know that they're, they're they're careful not to outright endorse the authoritarianism and the totalitarian approach of like censorship and we're going to ban this, but you can tell there's this sort of like, there's this sort of appreciation for it. Like, yeah, you know, like manly men, you know, China's appealing to manly men. And I find that interesting because the right is traditionally far more libertarian and far more like reduce the power of government. And here we have a totalitarian government that is coming up over the top in a totalitarian authoritarian way to promote traditional hierarchical structures of, um, of masculinity and femininity, masculinity in particular, and in China's own words, morality which I find very interesting. So there's all these kind of paradoxes. And this story to me is forcing so many people to cross traditional allegiances to figure out what they think about this, where they stand on this and what this really means. And I have a lot of thoughts on it that I want to speak to, but like, I'm curious how it, uh, you know, uh, how it strikes you off the, off the cuff here. Well, it's interesting. You know, I've been an actor for many, many years and um, there's been a, a major shift like in, in the, past for those who don't know i've been on walking dead and marvel's <laughs> i've been on a bunch of like you know these hollywood high production movies and all that stuff and it's like uh there's a lot of push for the exact opposite right so there's a lot of push for progressive hyper progressive values very extreme you're not allowed to have the opposite and i've noticed a pushback from china i mean even if you look at the star wars they're they're, they're very uh xenophobic they didn't want uh the black actor kind of highlighted on the poster and hollywood complied hollywood was like we'll make him smaller john i, I don't remember what his name is maybe boyega you mean boyega. they were racist they were just straight they were up. racist they're they, yeah. yeah i mean the the ccp does not want black actors promoted in china that's yeah. what it came down to but hollywood complied actors didn't make a big deal about it no one made a big deal about this crazy progressive movement was just silent about it yeah uh because that's where their money comes from and so you're going to see hollywood inevitably respond to this in a my expectation is a form of either ignoring it or complying because that's where their money comes from they will try and accommodate wherever their funding comes from as much as people have values they say they have values they really don't what they have is a desire to be funded a lot of the time mm -hmm. and so they'll be very hypocritical in what they believe in as for me personally mm -hmm. i believe it's you you know me and what it, when it comes to gender roles i think that china is actually the ccp knows that the world is getting uglier, mm -hmm. knows that there are going to be pushes for power taking place in the coming years, and yep. knows that a society that inherently has more masculine men yes. is going to be better suited to put yep. up that fight. That is Absolutely. what China knows. Yep. Now, the United States is doing the opposite. The United States is going a, a, along the lines of every ancient civilization that has crumbled where it started reducing 
any kind of concept of gender roles. And there's studies on this where you see every society that gets rid of gender roles inevitably crumbles, where the statues become effeminate for the men. And you see, like, they used to have statues of, like, where was it in Rome, where they had, like, incredibly powerful men as statues and art, and it went to feminizing men. And then as that happened, the, the culture decayed more into eventually crumbling. Uh, so I think China is aware of this. Do I think it's wrong that they're forcing it through government tyranny? Absolutely. Uh, but the concept itself of let's, if there was a dialogue in the United States of saying, hey, let's promote, and we still do promote it. If you look at Thor, he's super powerful. If you look at Chris Evans, and all our, all our archetypes are that way for a reason. Like we've talked talk to about- any teenage boy, taught to, taught to 10 teenage boys, nine out of 10 of them or eight out of 10 are going to have idols, role models that are going to be more um, expressively archetypally masculine. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. So carry on. And so uh, I think that the bigger problem, like I said, I think that Hollywood kind of has a, a, a problem in itself. It's trying to promote an ideology that will now not be funded by its one of its primary new funding sources. It's crazy. You see in many ways, it's like when LeBron James comes out and defends the CCP or when, Yep. Uh, Jackie Chan comes out and he's like, communist China's great. And I'm like, really? Like the CCP is great. Like it's very weird, but it's because people will be hypocritical when it comes to their own best interests. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm a little bit torn on it in terms of like, I do think there's a positive aspect. I think inherently young boys will be more attracted to watching powerful men. I think that's just what they'll want to see. And I don't mean powerful just physically. I mean, you know, across the board it's it's kind of what we inherently gravitate toward as boys uh certain qualities uh, i did watch cinderella just out of curiosity because of all the controversy around oh it. it's already out you can watch the whole thing or you watch the trailer on okay hbo i believe i can't remember where i watched it it's on hbo i think and uh but it's incredibly identity politics driven yeah incredibly identity politics driven. not just the masculinity issue uh-huh. all identity politics I mean, the opening, the first five minutes of the film is showing the poor people, kind of like the people who are working and like they're the, the lower class people. Vast majority of them are minorities, overwhelming majority of them. And they highlight people, you know what I mean? And then they lead into the rich family who are dislikable, who are kind of elitists, who are mistreating their sister. And they're white, as white as can be, and the mother's white as can be. And then Cinderella is back to being a Latina woman who is a minority. It, there's just a lot of play, even on a visual level of just uh, identity politics throughout it. Yep. That's become the mainstream kind of motivation of Hollywood. Masculine men are often now, if you look at like a lot of modern day kind of progressive ways of showing a ma- masculine man, like they're stupid or like they're, yes, uh, you know what I mean? And, and that's kind of been the historical display of the father in Hollywood anyway. Homer Simpson. Uh, family guy uh the father is always kind of like this dumb character who's incapable Um, it's very pronounced it's been very pronounced in the last probably three decades yeah yeah so again i think it's it's and and what have we seen in the past three decades father's not staying at home (laughs) increased divorce uh so if we're we're talking on a personal level i think it's quite obvious that people do inherently appreciate gender roles and we've talked about this before it doesn't have to be that the man is a man or the woman's a woman it has to be that there are roles that are set in any relationship that works, in my opinion. Sometimes the woman will take on more of what those masculine roles are, and the man will take on more of those feminine roles. I'm not inherently against that, but I do know that promoting uh, like these archetypes are healthy to a strong society in an imperfect world where you need strong men. So this is my curiosity. Here's one of the, here's kind of one of the, the, um, the binaries that I that that stood out to me about this story. So when you get a totalitarian government and you get a totalitarian movement in any situation, very often there's a need to appropriate and redefine moral structures of a given society because you can't truly have full power over the people and full allegiance over the people or of the people if the people are still appealing to, let's say, natural law natural universal objective hierarchies of moral value or objective uh, objective hierarchies of masculinity and femininity so a more pure 
expression of masculinity and a more pure expression of femininity. If you are a totalitarian dictator, if you're a totalitarian Machiavellian schemer, then in order to get allegiance to the government, you have to basically create a mentality and a belief system, almost a sub-religion of the state, a statolatry, wherein the people are looking to the state to define what the morality is, to define what the roles are, rather than surpassing and looking above the government to say, what is good and bad? Is that a matter of God or what is masculine and feminine? So what's curious to me in this situation is when China speaks of this appeal to morality, and to um, and, and 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 juxtaposes vulgarity, which they're saying is the presentation of the fairy godmother and, and the sissy men, um, to morality uh, and traditional Chinese values and things like that. Are they? Do you think they're coming at that from a standpoint of we're in charge of the moral spectrum here? The CCP is dictating what the politically correct moral spectrum is. Like you used the words just now, there have to be roles that are set. So that to me sounds a little bit cultural relativist, like as long as we're setting some roles for order in society, it's cool, as long as there's some definitions. My question is, is that where the Chinese party is coming from or are they appealing to what they would consider an eternal objective morality? And if they are, it sounds to me like it's a step back from totalitarianism. It might be more physical control, but if they're relinquishing the moral, uh, the moral territory or the moral ground, to something that just exists independent of the CCP. I find that pretty interesting. So I think that is maybe on some level what's happening. I'll, ex I'll explain why. Okay, so I think number one, there's two things that are happening. I think that their values as the CCP align with a higher, at this time, align with a higher objective truth, hmm. right? So in North Korea, the only objective truth or the only truth that is allowed is that uh, the state is God, right? Essentially, they don't even have a word for love. They only have a so word that's for the love. one. That's the one objective truth. There's no room for any, any, anything, anything else. else over there. Yeah. Yes. I mean, right. and that's all they know. But China does function a little bit differently. And I think that's why China is actually almost more dangerous in its ability to kind of uh, in its in its kind of approach to power, uh, because China understands a greater game plan in all of this. Like I said, China knows that there is an objective truth, the objective truth or there's an absolute truth. Right. The absolute truth is that strong men create strong, strong societies. Right. And weak men create weak societies. They know this. Yep. And that is an appeal to a higher power. We're creating That's an absolute truth that has measurable social implications that are desirable to them. Mm -hmm. And so China's objective is not the CCP's objective is not to itself. It is to a greater ideology, which is a greater China spread throughout the entire world. It is for power and control. So the CCP's best way to get control is to appeal to this higher moral value at this time. That's what I honestly believe. So I believe they're aware of what they're doing. I believe that they do know it's an absolute truth and that they're appealing to some kind of higher value. I also think that's an incredibly powerful thing to do to your own population because it, it raises the very question that you, you just brought up. If you were this totalitarian government, if you were this, which they are, if you were this terrible government, why would you appeal to something higher than yourself? Why would you allow the, yeah, why would you allow that to be a, an Archimedean point? You, you know the concept of an Archimedean point? No, explain it to me. So Archimedes was this like Greek mathematician and he said, give me, a, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. The idea being, if he could find a fulcrum point outside of the world that was fixed, he could get a lever strong enough to actually move the world with his own body but the idea being you need a fixed point outside of the controllable the controllable territory so the the moral the it's got moral implications too that's a physical quanta or, or that's like a physics type observation or a mathematical observation but it's also an existential observation wherein if you um if you have a moral structure that supersedes anything social anything um uh, cultural, uh, then that's what you must, that has the ultimate authority. So, yeah. So what I'm saying is, um, it is, is, is China admitting an Archimedean point of moral structure to the universe, or are they, do you think they're just keeping it that morality in general is nothing more than a, than the optimal social outcome? 
are they allowing an Archimedean point for their people to perceive and appreciate? I, I think that right now China does not perceive its own people as the uh, biggest obstacle. Uh -huh. And so they don't, I don't, so in other words, what they are opening here, whether they're aware of it or not, is an opportunity for revolt one day. Yes, right? that's, that's what I'm curious about, yeah. They are doing that, yes. But uh, is it not absolutely necessary for them to take that risk right now for what they might believe are the next steps of society? In other words, if their society right. becomes feminized, yes. heavily feminized, and they don't have strong men, right. and th they lose in the end of the day too. So they have to take a kind of stance on the issue. Yeah, it's very curious, right? So like... Um... I believe so, I'll, you know, I've, I've been asking these kind of like rhetorical questions or hypothetical questions, but, you know, I believe that there is a, an objective moral structure to to creation itself, you know, not that that applies not just to humanity and not just to the social sphere or the cultural sphere, but to existence in the fabric of reality itself. And I and I believe that the masculine and feminine dimensions um that the masculine and feminine govern different aspects of that of that fabric of reality and that as men we can fully live into as a moral undertaking the the masculine responsibilities or the masculine expressions of what it means to be a man and that those will yield fruit those will yield good fruit for ourselves for our souls for our minds and for the people around us and i believe the same thing um of of uh of femininity um so do you see china as having a choice because imagine china that's what i was getting at yeah yeah that's what that was my train of thought um when one so so if you're if you're experiencing say de cultural decay like you pointed out let's say cultural mm -hmm. decay uh, throughout history has maybe manifested or presented itself as, as gender roles getting more blended and, and less defined and less less complementary and more vacuous and more nebulous um, then there are social economic political psychological existential spiritual implications of that which the, the populace the quality of life degenerates for everything the thing implodes and, and ruins itself so yeah i think that if china is um cognizant uh like you you're you're describing them as being then um they um If it, no, they don't. They don't have a choice. If 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 they're going to try to maintain dominance as the totalitarian superpower of the world, I think that that is the obvious choice for a totalitarian government. To it make. is the obvious choice. That's what I'm saying. So it's not like a shocking thing, in my view. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I th I think it's not shocking either. I think it's more informative, right? I think like what what I what, what I can do with this with this article with this situation is appreciate even more the absolute um that the the absolute objectivity of of both morality but also of, of of the masculine and feminine dimensions of society the masculine and feminine expressions of society otherwise this wouldn't be a necessary role to maintain to maintain strength and cohesion in the world it would be irrelevant you know yeah, it's absolutely relevant you know what I mean? Like it's absolutely relevant. That's the that's the reality of it. I think China again knows this. It's so yeah. interesting. Like I said, China will risk a future, a more powerful population, which is the last thing a totalitarian government wants. It will risk that. It will risk a, a population that is far more likely to revolt, far more likely to not be willing to hear, to be controlled. Uh, at because they see the greater loss as having a population that is no longer strong. Mm -hmm. So strength, in this case, strength, strength outweighs statolatry for them. In this sense, out. big time. Because it's not, because what is their goal? Do you think their goal is just to have a strong China? Or their goal is to, to have some kind of, eventually some kind of impact on the entire world, which is quite obvious that they've already started doing things to imply that. Mm -hmm. Their goal isn't just to be China. Their goal is, I don't want to say world domination, at least not in the traditional sense like Hitler, where they go out and start a war. Uh, but they do have bigger plans than just China. So perhaps this is why, again, some individuals on the right like are, are somewhat gleeful about it, because they're seeing 
that China has had to balk on its extreme left-wing social engineering. I mean, this could be this could be seen as a social engineering move. I mean, it is. It is literally and de facto a social engineering move. Yes. But it's not an arbitrary social engineering move. It's not like, hey, let's make men women just for the sake of rebelling against tradition. This is a social engineering move that appeals to natural structures of biology and and, and structures that evolve naturally without a totalitarian forceful mm-hmm. type, type thing. So I think people on the right that are gleeful and appreciative of this are like, see, even though even though this is this is an uh, an example of totalitarianism at work, they're appealing to a natural structure rather than an arbitrary one. And ironically, that that natural structure that they're appealing to can one day be the downfall of totalitarianism. Yeah, yeah, very curious. And may, maybe it will be. And maybe this is an interesting thing to keep an eye out for. Um, I don't personally uh, fear China gaining world dominance just because I fear another country other than America gaining world dominance. I fear China but gaining world dominance because I fear a totalitarian communist regime doing it. So if China was uh, uh, a, di- a different story and gained strength on a, on a global level that out that outpaced the US, I don't, you know, there's a level of patriotism that would that would want to resist that for a while, but I don't know that I would I would uh, fear it. F- fear it if it was a completely different gov- entity. That sure, was if it was a benign, down. if it was a, a benign ideology, if it was. That's right. Then, yeah. and it gained traction organically just because it was a superior ideology. Right. Right. Then, whatever we're doing, we're doing capitalism, then whatever's going on right now. And, you know, uh, you know, so whether we're a democracy or a republic, you know, whatever that new form of government would be that organically gained power and it was called China and it was not a totalitarianism, communist uh, government. If, if that just happened because it was simply a better government and it could, in fact, spread naturally throughout the world and make a better world, you know, by all means. I have an attachment to this country. I love the United yeah. States, and I believe that it's the cur- best current form of government that can exist, one that prioritizes personal freedom above all else. At least I hope we continue to. But the Constitution itself, I think, is brilliant. Yeah. So if something better than that comes along and, and, and kind of pushes the United States forward and still maintains those personal freedoms and is still having a positive effect on the world and somehow it's solving more world problems... <laughs> Then by all means, I mean, that's kind of a natural evolution. I'm not saying that our form, our current form of government may not be sustainable forever, especially if you think of as things like automation occur. And imagine we have full automation and full, you know, th- th- we're going to have to rethink the way things work eventually. We're just heading to a point technologically where the way things work will have to change on some level. Yeah. In terms of, of cap, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, forms of the way we look at the economy uh in, in terms of capitalism in terms of you know all these ideas oh well my camera went out okay i'm back but uh right now i do believe those are the best forms of government i'm curious about one thing um or if you if you or if you're game for me kind of bringing this to another another territory sure go ahead so um we're talking about China, you know, specifically and in authoritarianism, totalitarianism, kind of like fiat force of, of, of uh, masculinity or feminine or gender roles, if you want to call it that. What do you think happened? What do you think is the primary? Because um, let's say that we've lost that in America. Let's just, you know, admit the premise that we've lost any particular fidelity or um, allegiance to uh, masculinity and femininity well, and we, things in the U.S. We have in our institutions, but look behind yes. me. I mean, I know my room's a mess. I'm doing construction, but look what I have there. I have the Hulk, right. Deadpool, yeah. Predator, Robocop. These are all exactly what we're talking about. So everything that like I grew up with as a kid and yeah. Marvel Studios is still promoting as much as they're progressive are yeah. still these archetypes. So right. I don't think we've lost it. I think it, it, right. it, it's too soon to say we've lost. I think our institutions have been very much brainwashed. So maybe that answers the question, which is my question is, is it liberalism or is it our own brand of authoritarianism that has caused that decay and degeneration in our culture? Because one one 
one camp, maybe the the right wing traditionalist camp would say it's because we've just been too open. We've we've let all boundaries, all traditions crumble and we became too open to exploring and too tolerant to new views and new perspectives. And that's what's caused this kind of cultural decay. But then there's another perspective, which is this was foisted by ideologues from higher education and powerful institutions as an, as an attempt to rebel against the natural structures that made up the culture in the first place. So that's something else, it could be replaced with something else. So was it a result of liberal, too much liberalism or was it our own version of authoritarianism that was going in the opposite direction of China, which was to break down everything traditional rather than build it up? I have to believe, I know you once told me this is incidental. You believe it's potentially incidental. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is intentional because every structure being pushed by all the institutions today, whether it's entertainment, media, government, big tech, mm -hmm. all these things are counter not only to uh, traditional American foundational values, mm -hmm. like you have people burning the flag, the flag is now white supremacists, uh, you know, all these things that... Uh, freedom of speech is now offensive. 60% <laughs> millennials polled. 60%, I believe. Don't quote me on that exact number. There was a study, don't believe in absolute freedom of speech. They believe that speech should be limited. So there's, it's not just an attack on that. It's not just an attack on our constitution. I mean, most people are not, there's, a, most Democrats are not pro gun rights. There's a, there's a lot of Democrats who, I don't know if it's most, I have to look up the statistics, but definitely not. There's a big push from the left that is more anti-gun than from the right. So certain constitutional values are under attack, but it's not just those constitutional values, which are absolutes. In other words, freedom of speech is freedom of speech. It's not freedom of speech when I like it and not freedom of speech when I don't. That's an absolute concept. But it's also on, as you were talking about, absolute truths. Gender is under heavy attack. Mm -hmm. The sanctity of life is under mm -hmm. heavy attack. Mm -hmm. So things that go beyond government are mm -hmm. under heavy attack. Things that are literally the fabric of our, our reality. I thought about this. If you can, and I talk about this a lot, but it's interesting to me because if you can justify putting a male rapist in a female prison and then he rapes his female cellmate because he identifies as a female, impregnates her, and you still cannot speak out about that. And this is happening not once, not twice. This is happening in most of the places where these laws where you're allowing prisoners to identify as what they are, as what they choose, not as what they are, to go to those prisons. In other words, I'm a male rapist, but I say I'm a female today. I go to a female prison. You have now taken such a hard stance against absolute truth. And there's consequences to your stance. There's directly visible consequences. There are women being raped. In the UK, it was 24 women when they put the male rapist in the female prison. In the United, in California recently, it happened, I think, in Michigan or something like that, too. It's happened in multiple places. Anyway, it's happened repeatedly. So it's not just an isolated incident. We know what happens when you put male rapists in female prisons who, just because they say they're female. And yet you're still willing to say under all circumstances, a man who says they're a woman is a woman. There is no such thing as gender. It is totally self-identified. You're still willing to go that far. To me, if you can, it's a powerful thing. Whoever pushed that, right? And again, I'm very empathetic to people who are, who are trans. I think it is something that is... I can't imagine how hard it is to go through to not feel comfortable in your own skin. That must be terrible. But there's a line. There is a line on how far society will go to accept what you're saying is an absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And so, but people are have bypassed that. So imagine the power of whoever pushed this through. Imagine you're the person sitting there, the group sitting there, and you've managed to convince the population that this is okay. You could convince them anything. Right. To convince them that we need to put people into concentration camps because sure. they're less than human. Sure. There is no more limit on what you. So that is I don't believe it's incidental because if it was, then em, then empathy and basic common sense would still to some degree be intact. Right. If it was completely incidental when we had a male rapist go into a female prison or when we have a pro male fighter, go fight a female fighter and crack her skull literally in half, like crack her skull. We as an entire society, regardless of those who were, had empathy toward trans people don't, would say enough is enough. This doesn't make sense. When we have males who identify as female going to the doctor with to Planned Parenthood, like Steven Crowder tested, and he, he purposely went in with a positive pregnancy test. It's, it's on YouTube. Maybe they took it down. It's very interesting. He goes into a Planned Parenthood 
he's clearly a man. He's like six foot four, stubble. He just put on a wig, goes into a Planned Parenthood uh, with his friend who's in a wheelchair. And he says, that's his husband or boyfriend. And he says, I think I'm pregnant. Now, again, I don't know if anyone here doesn't know what Steven Crowder looks like. He's, ex- he's There's no way you can mistake Steven Crowder for a female. And he goes and he takes the uh, pee that his friend gave him, which is a woman that is, she's pregnant. And he fills that th- up the cup with that and he gives it to him. Now, what's interesting is if a man comes back with a positive pregnancy test, it's a huge indicator of potential testicular cancer or prostate cancer. Okay. I believe it's prostate cancer. And so he gives them that test. Now, any, uh, any good doctor would say, hey, I understand you're, you identify as a female, but you had a pro- positive pregnancy test and you're a biological male, you have to get tested for cancer. You have to get tested for cancer. A doctor's job is to save your life. But none of them were willing to say it. They didn't want to offend him. So they let someone who pretend, and he left there, and they never called him to say, get checked for cancer. It's all on hidden camera. It's all real. You know, you could deny it's happening, but it's happening to the point where doctors who literally their sole job is to give you this information are saying, no, I don't want to deal with the repercussions of being called a transphobe. It's absolute power. If you have, yes, absolute power, you're right. And it's absolute power, which has been achieved. And I think what this, what what we're talking about and and China's move proves and what our situation in this country proves that doctors can't even help people anymore is that when you're out, there's no, is that there is no possibility for absolute power from a governmental level. As soon as it's attempted, you have to crumble natural natural structures and objective truth to the point where you destroy the society or the system that you're trying to have absolute power over. And you have to start again with allegiance to and recognition of objective truth. I guess what I'm saying is there is no absolute power over God. Creation with God is the Godhead in my, in my view. I think that you can hold that same perspective without perhaps believing in God. I'm not sure because I'm not, I'm not of that camp, but, but I believe that that's true. You cannot, you cannot do it. I mean, we fear it. I fear it all the time. The world we're living in right now, these mandates everywhere. I fear and I observe these, these attempts at absolute power keeps me up at night, but perhaps there should be some sort of uh, resolve and peace inside knowing that that can't be accomplished within the, the natural structures and natural laws that, that we live with here. Well, the problem in all that is if 99 out of 100 people believe something that's completely untrue and you're the one person who, who, who knows the truth, you're the crazy one. Yes. So they still have the power. I mean, in other words, you can never really go against an absolute truth. It will always remain that way. But there are consequences. Those consequences are ones that you and I might suffer. Our kids might suffer. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. They have, they have the power, but they can never have the absolute power again, because our, our nation as, as this, as it's eating itself politically, culturally, socially, spiritually, economically, as we're eating ourselves because of the insanity of there not being a fixed node to even leap off of, as there being no Archimedean points, as there being no objective truth, a doctor can't even obje- uh, recognize objective truth. We're crumbling entirely yes. to the point where we can't, where we can't, we won't be able to compete if we continue on this trajectory with a nation like China. So that, that's what I'm saying is that it, it corrects itself and there may be some temporary period of close to absolute power in this country, but it won't get to absolute it because never. it will self-destruct first. It will always self-destruct. As I had said, if you look, there's studies on it in the in the other civilizations historically that started doing this. Yeah. It's a common, yeah, when yeah. societies become strong, they start looking inward and becoming hyper philosophical and existential. And, and you know what I mean? Like you said, there's like this incidental thing that occurs to head toward moral relativism and there are no absolutes. And I do believe you cannot believe in religion and still believe in absolute, that the universe has some kind of rules to it, mm-hmm. that it has some kind of absolute morals. But it's interesting because I have a lot of friends who don't have any. And like I said, you know, religion for me is something I've struggled with my whole life. I just mm-hmm. have a very hard time with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I see its immense value and power. And, and so much so as any society, I believe, that doesn't believe in absolute truths will self-implode. My, my negative for that is I know you have peace in that. The problem is that we're the ones who suffer that. We live here. When that, my dad always tells me, he goes, no matter how good it gets, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much people can fight against reality, reality will always self-correct. 
You can yeah. only push, 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 push. The more you push, the bigger the correction will be. Never. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm like, but that doesn't make me feel better. That means uh-huh. that there's there's a huge correction coming. You know, like he even he's he lost a lot of his family in the Holocaust. He actually raised it as an example. He was like, look, it's self corrected. In the end of the day, the truth won. It came out. I'm like. Six million Jews dead, a million gypsies, you know, 20 million people and over 40 million people in a world war. I'm like, that's not the kind of correction I want to see take place. I don't want to see that happen. Like the rules of the universe will remain the rules of the universe, regardless of how you or I feel about it. And, but there are consequences. Sure. Um, and we're seeing them now. A woman being raped, someone who has testicular cancer or prostate cancer, not being told by their doctor. These are things that are not normal. And even more so, the biggest one, the most the most definitive proof of this to me is the, the divide we see in how people perceive abortion. There is no clearer divide to me. Human life has value, parasite, piece of shit, kill it, I don't care. Now, every single person I argue with on the side of parasite, piece of shit, don't care, admits by the time they're done arguing with me, I, we all, and this is what they all say, Yes, we all know deep down that it's a human life. We all know that because they can't. In the end of the day, anyone who's, you know, has an iota of truth to them when they're debating this will come clean and admit that. But they go, I don't care. I don't believe that there is an absolute moral that it's wrong to kill. I don't believe in it. So they start having to get very defensive every time I debate this. And actually pulling back on, there is no moral argument that they can make. So morals don't exist to them. Kill it as it's coming out. They become extra defensive. Just kill it as it's coming out. I don't care. It's her body, her choice. And I'm like, you're getting very agitated for one. And I think we both, and you even admitted, it's not just her body. I don't care. I don't care. It's like, it doesn't matter. They, they'll come from, I literally have had people tell me, I no longer care about morals. You're trying to make a moral argument. Everything is, a, is a subjective. Ethics are subjective. So the only reason you feel it's wrong, tell me why it's wrong. I'm like, it, again, now I can't make an argument against you anymore. You've literally just denied that there are any absolute truths. So ki- I, I asked him, so killing Jews in the Holocaust was not, mo- there are no morals. Maybe in, our t- in today's society, we find it wrong, but it wasn't wrong. It wasn't absolutely wrong. They can't answer that. No, you can't, you can't have a, you can't, you can't engage in a discussion from a position, from a positionality with a directional argument and not believe that there's an absolute structure. Yes. Even though they claim they don't believe in it, you you can, you can start, you can enter the gate by saying morals are all subjective, but you will not make it very far down if you're dealing with an incisive thinker before getting broken down to the point that you're actually trying to stand on, on a, on a absolute platform of some sort of absolute structure. Otherwise, there's absolutely no incentive and no position to engage in an argument in the first place. Well, that's what it always comes down to. I literally ask them, Jews in the Holocaust, and they all say, I think it was wrong. Yeah. I'm like, is it absolutely sure. wrong? Sure, it's absolutely wrong. Why? You don't believe that anything can be absolutely wrong. How come yeah. killing Jews in the Holocaust was wrong? They can't answer it. They start getting this because they because we all know. Yes. We all know that it's wrong to kill an innocent life. Right. That is ingrained in us, whether through biology, through natural law, or through law of God. Mm -hmm. It's ingrained in us. We wouldn't be here today without it. Exactly. Exactly. So I hear you. Like, yeah, no, the the piece, the piece is 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 like what what's the what's the playing field that you are that you are appealing to, you know? And here's where the God and the eternal soul piece comes in for me. And I don't believe in God for a functional purpose. I don't do it because I don't, I don't believe in order to get something out of it, I believe because I believe, and then things happen. Um, But there are certain, and Jordan Peterson does this a lot, he kind of describes the functional positive results of of a religious life, you know, and he kind of sticks to to it from a a pragmatic standpoint rather than a a faithful standpoint. But that said, if you're dealing with a playing field that has to do with the continuum of the soul, then there is peace in knowing and, and, and there is solace in knowing that if I act and if I subscribe to and if i continually renew my covenant with god to understanding to living into to discovering the truth of moral objectivity of this universe and of creation then then i can polish myself to be a diamond and a gem and that is an end in itself and if you don't have that 
if you don't have, well, I don't want to say you, I believe that if I, if I didn't have that wider continuum that I was operating in, I wouldn't have a choice, but to almost be driven mad by my lack of control of the particular physical manifestation of a given time. And in, in, in both, in both situations, you should, and you can engage to try to stop immoral things from happening and to promote morality. We still, despite the fact that I believe everybody's got an immortal soul and my ultimate goal is to polish myself as a diamond and to discover that, that truth and to live into that truth. That doesn't mean I've got a freebie pass to let the Jews be executed or to, or to just say, oh, it's all just chasing after the, the wind or things, things come and go or things self-correct. You know, There's still a, a mandate and a responsibility to engage on a physical level um, based, on, the, based on, on a moral level, you know, based on uh, well, that, that, the very truth. You know? It's interesting because those same people who make that argument, why it doesn't affect you. Why do you care? That's the number one argument I hear about things today. Of course it does especially with abortion. I'm like, it all affects me, yeah. it, it, you know, and it affects the whole world. And it's, it, it's interesting because I always make the argument. They're like, it's not your body. It's not your child. Why do you care what happens? I'm like, well, you know what? If people were out killing homeless people, I'm not homeless. I would still care. I would still do everything I can to stop homeless people from being killed because yeah. they were a burden to society or whatever, you know, people would say, oh, well, they have this. Is, it's the same argument for homeless people as it is for, for uh, fetuses. The same arguments are made. Burden to society, nowhere to go, will have shit lives. That's what I always hear people say. They're going to have shit lives anyway. Just end it. Those are the same arguments you can make to someone who's homeless. So then by that logic, why are we not going out and killing homeless people? But they don't know what to say when you say that. They don't have an argument. And some of them will say, fine, let's kill homeless people. And I'm like, okay, well now, and you know what I mean? Like they'll just agree because they realize they have to dive so far into such a dark place. Sure. You know, and they'll just go for it. They're all in. Yeah, we should. I've had people tell me, yeah, let's kill newborns. Let's do it. Fine. If they, because they don't want to admit there, there's an, they'll do anything at that point not to admit that they're, number one, that their argument makes no sense. And number two, that they're, that we can all agree that some things are just wrong. Uh, it's scary that we no longer live in a world where we can all agree that some things are just wrong. Well, yeah, I would say that that's the definition of evil. Like what you're describing is a, is a false courage wherein somebody orients or orients themselves toward rebellion against truth as a continual assertion um, of their own self-importance and continual rebellion against truth. It's, it's, a, it's an orientation that positions freedom and liberation as uh, something that can be attained only to the degree to which you can rebel and reject that which is. The more that I can recreate or create in my own image uh, a true a truth or a moral system, the more that I'm liberating myself and liberating others around me versus the traditional standpoint, the enlightenment standpoint, the religious standpoint is I must direct myself towards truth and live into that and subscribe to it and be obedient to it in order to liberate myself. Those who define fr freedom and their own liberation and other people's liberation as something that can only be accomplished through rebellion against that which is and that which is truth create chaos around them and misery. Um, but it's a it's a it's a very addictive place to be, and it's a faux courage. It's a false courage because they're presenting themselves as oh, I don't subscribe to any god, I don't subscribe to any truth, I don't I don't have this superstitious belief in truth. But in reality, it's a cowardice because they're afraid of actually doing the work and taking the observance and meditation to understand what truth is and living into that because that takes far more effort than just a constant pissing away uh, and blathering on about your own mental delusions. You know what I'm saying? And pretending that they have some validity. It's really interesting because if like if if you're strictly a materialist, you believe like we only have this. There's nothing after this life. Consciousness is entirely brain based. Uh, then by definition, there is no such thing as absolute morals, hmm. right? There, there can't be. Why would there be? You're just saying that we're, and everything is, an, is a result of, uh, of randomness. Uh, then ethics are just set by the civilization in that moment, and there is no absolute morals. I think okay. that there, you might be right about that. And I think that this is one of those high, high-minded debates that philosophers have of those who believe in God and those who don't. Like if you go to, Christopher Hitchens debates that he would consistently have with like religious um, 
religious philosophers, th th this was kind of a crux point is the absolutism of morality and whether it can be upheld and from an atheist standpoint or a materialist standpoint or not. And Hitchens never made a convincing argument to me, but I do think that the argument can, can potentially be engaged in. What is the argument? I if think we're that, all a result of randomness, right? And everything is random. There is nothing after this. Everything is, is just the physical world. What is the argument? I think the argument is that there's common directionalities that people that that can be observed, defined, and and um, and named and named um, cross culturally and throughout time that people find themselves in that they identify as good and evil, and that there's not a whole lot of variance in that in that but, that there's really like cultural relativism is primarily aesthetic and an aesthetic thing, and not even an even aesthetics are very very consistent throughout time. The, the, the draw to beauty, the observance of that which is beautiful, structures of beauty, structures of morality are, are, are very consistent. So again, it goes back to the point of- um, But we also have massive tragedies throughout history, like the Holocaust, like- Armenian I'm speaking from a- or... Yes, but I'm speaking from a materialist point of view that there can, I'm saying that I, I believe that uh, a, mat a strict materialist, which I am not, would be able to make a pretty good argument that there's an independent moral structure to the universe. Wouldn't that imply absolute truths? Yes. So in all this randomness, they're saying there is some form of order that is absolute. Yeah, I, th I think that that's an argument that could be made. I've never tried to make it because I'm a theist. You know, but I, I understand think, that, but doesn't that imply some kind of higher power or some kind of order or some kind of... Uh... It, it implies absolute order, but I'm not sure that someone would have to admit a conscious and intelligent creator in order to admit absolute order. So the absolute order is created through randomness? I don't know that they would have to uh, admit randomness. But, they, but materialists do believe that the universe itself is created through randomness. Uh -huh. That the Big Bang was random, or that the order of life and Every, virtually stuff. all things are created by happenstance. That there is no the second there's a driving force behind the universe, then you're no longer truly a materialist. I think my okay. materialists, by definition, believe in a chaotic universe. That, okay. they, that we are here as a result of chance. Yeah, it's maybe the argument can't be made. Then I mean, if you're coming from a place of random ness um without intention i don't know i don't know i'll think about it i don't know if the argument can be made. and even if there was why would you follow it even if there was some in other words let's say there was some kind of you you could make the argument that the universe kind of has a, some kind of unidirectionality toward having these things happen and toward everything you just said much more eloquently than i could ever say well, well let's put it this way let's put it in star wars terms this might help you understand and okay so Star Wars is a non-theistic universe that still has a Jedi, uh, it has a moral dimension to it. Uh, the Yoda, the Jedis, they are living into the moral absolute structure of the universe. They call it the force. It's the force. It's this idea of a moral, you know. You're uh, still, but you're still making my argument that is still something greater than yourself that is absolute, that when you die, you are not yeah. truly gone. You return to the fabric of what it was. You're eternal. Okay, so you, so so in your view, then the, I guess we just need to get our premises and our language straight. So you you in your view, the the Star Wars universe is not a materialist universe. It's not what, a materialist uh, universe at all. Okay, no, the okay. Second, the second that when they died, they still were eternal. Their energy still was part of the universe that could still kind of in ways communicate, and you know what I mean. They're never really gone, and there are these absolute good and evils in that universe that are They're beyond yes. what. Yes, absolutely. Beyond physical, far beyond physical. But there's not a God. There's not you a, need a God, real, though. That was my point. That yeah. was my point. Sure, it doesn't have to be God. But I think in an entirely random universe, which most material materialists are, they go, it's my brain. I'm just here because of my brain. I'm just here by accident. I was born by accident. All things are, are just a result of randomness. Now, we make decisions, sure. But the fact that humanity even evolved was all a result of randomness. The fact that, uh, you know, everything is randomness. Uh -huh. yeah. The entire universe in itself, the fact that the earth was formed, the fact that everything happened the way it did is all a result of just happenstance. 
So it sounds like the intent, like the, the, the intention that's, that comes along with that. Um, and I know what you're saying now, and I know what you're describing. I mean, again, I've never found a materialist, read a materialist, heard a materialist who is, who, who speaks, teaches from a standpoint of trying to, of, of, of promoting purpose. Generally, the position that they take is one of breaking down purpose and saying it's all meaningless. Yeah, you because know, why, why would you? That comes, right. So maybe it just inherently comes along with the territory and they have no choice once they adopt that view. Is what because you could theoretically do whatever you want. Now, there are consequences. We'll put you in jail. But there are no like real consequences beyond that. If you could get away with it, there, there are no real ethics. There, I mean, other than those set by society. Again, there's no real morals. So uh, you could say, well, I killed somebody and I got away with it. And that's OK, because I got away with it. You I think there's that- more mystical scientists who. Let's take it from this point, and I haven't looked into this in the last couple of years, but I wrote my thesis in college from a standpoint that was kind of. I don't know if it was materialist. It kind of was. But um, I think that there are this day and age and over the last 20 years, a lot of quantum mechanical quantum physicists who who believe that there can be physical evidence of spiritual phenomena and that there are spiritual. Wait, wait, can you hold this thought? I'm making you the host. And then uh, you got to. uh, You got to become the leader of the class, the, the teacher. You're now the host. Okay. Can you can you go in and make yourself the? Uh, oh, I don't know. Where do I find it? On the upper right hand side, it should say immersive view. All right. Okay, students. <laughs> All, right. All right. So listen up. So this is, I think, more where I was intuitively coming from is that in the last twenty years, let's say, there has been a contingent or a brand of of quantum physicist that has that 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 tends to want to blend spiritual and religious phenomena with quantum physics and explain religion in physical terms um with 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 the idea that if we were able to measure and observe things on 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 a minute enough physical level then we would have uh we would have measurable physical i don't know atomic or you know it's quantum it's quantum physics so subatomic um evidence for moral purposeful phenomena have you ever um, have you ever read that's almost like a that's like a mystical materialist almost but there is an there is a, a a a line of inquiry from a quantum mechanics and quantum physics standpoint that is inquiring into religious and moral questions from a, from a more materialist uh, perspective, yeah. which is interesting. I don't know if it's possible. Yes, uh, Ilan. Thank you. Um, there's a, uh, a, there's two guys, uh, Robert Penrose, and I can't remember the other guy, they did biocentricity. So it's a physicist, a quantum physicist and a biologist. And uh, they have incredibly interesting work on uh, not only how consciousness can carry on after the physical body dies through like they, they believe that consciousness is actually kept in the brain in these microtubules on a quantum level or something like that but they also talk about how biology itself is a fundamental driving force of the universe and reality that the universe is designed to inevitably create biological life forms that can observe it and that quantum physics actually proves this and they got together the biologists and the quantum physicists and they actually put all the data forward mm-hmm. biocentricity mm-hmm. i believe that's what it is it, i i read their book yeah. years ago fantastic they break okay. down everything on how the universe does have an intention in many ways in itself to uh, so then 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 how does okay so now that you've kind of reflected on that do, would you say that those authors are materialists who who are trying to demonstrate intrinsic purpose and, and moral structure to the universe or no? No. Why not? Because they've taken the randomness equation out of it. They did take the randomness equation out. Okay. Okay. Right. It's the randomness that's totally, totally relevant here. I don't care if it's God. I don't care if it's the universe. I, like, again, even believing in some form of like natural law that some things are just yeah. wrong by nature, by yeah. inherently goes yeah. against what I perceive it. Maybe I'm defining materialism wrong. Maybe there's another name for these people that are like, that 
just believe that everything is just a matter of chance. Yeah, we can call them materialists for now. Yeah, it's the dominant. It's the dominant orthodoxy within the university system today. It's it's essentially nihilism. You know, it's it's it nihilism. A, yeah, but nihilism leads to very troubling behavior. Often. Of course, yeah, it's a shit way of thinking. It's a it's a it's a self important rebellion against all that's that's real and true and everything that any great intellectual throughout time up until probably eighteen hundred, you know, uh, applied themselves towards all of the great philosophers, all of the great scientists had a dedi- had a purposeful dedication to what they were doing until very recently when it became much more nihilistic, you know, the last 150 years, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I learned a lot again today, Jordan. Thank you. <laughs> no, me too. I'm glad that we discussed it. I, th- I think it, you know, you know, we can, we don't have any time left, but I think there's just uh, so many, so many, binaries that are that are created from that china story and i'm glad that we explored a lot of them um it's it's fascinating we're at an interesting place in in the continuum and and things are continually moving and maybe uh maybe it's not maybe it's not all lost maybe it'll just get get shittier and shittier and then start to get good again who knows well it's interesting i think you nailed it on the head when you said like that the conclusion to all of this was that you are you have hope that when there is such a uh, kind of response against absolute truths, like denying these gender roles or whatever those things are, that there is a decay that inevitably happens in society. It's also interesting that the CCP might be so self-aware that they can come to the same conclusion and do what is both in and not in their best interests at the same time. (laughs) On on another, we're not really investigative journalists, but I would, like to dive you know it's speculative and and i i I don't want to go down this wormhole right now but on another note and in another conversation we could speculate a little bit about how the ccp financially has potentially funded this the type of social engineering program we've seen in this country which is just which is to blend skew and and erase the gender roles and 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 then while in their own country they they're obviously building them up and, and looking to make them more rigid and defined. So it's a, it's a soft kind of warfare because um, a lot of the highest universities have very, very, the universities with the same gender studies departments that are churning out the, the most um, referenced um, intersectional and, 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 and gender-based uh, misinformation, I would call it, or disinformation or pseudoscience um, have, uh, have uh, close ties with, uh, with China, those universities. So it's like, are they subversively programming us toward degenerate social uh, norms while a, as a strategy of soft warfare so that they don't have, so they don't have to come sword to sword? I don't know. And they won't have to. Yeah, speculative, very speculative. It's that speech by Ronald Reagan that by the time our enemies yeah. come, we will have laid down our swords. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we will hate our own country so much. Uh, well, if you read The Art of War, Right. The ancient Chinese proverbs, uh, Sun Tzu or whatever, one of them is like the war is won before the battle begins. Mm-hmm. You know, you've already won. You, you have to already win before you engage the enemy. Mm-hmm. Especially in 2021. Yeah. <laughs> world than, uh, than back then. But even then they knew it. Even then when they had to have hand to hand warfare. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate the time. We should start doing this every week. Okay, let's do it again sometime. I've got it on my schedule for next week. Okay, great. Thanks, Jordan. I'm going to upload this now. Okay, bye. Bye.